aside from basically its first day, Pentecost, Christianity has rarely been healthy. Almost immediately, the church had liars in its midst, Ananias and Sapphira, bickering over food distribution, Acts 6, 1. Pretty soon she was besieged with false teachers, had churches going in the wrong directions, like Corinth and Ephesus, to name a few, and was plagued by the ones Paul called Judaizers, trying to set up their own rules and their own movements. Various leaders concocted heresies, Various movements like Gnosticism tried to infiltrate, and various anonymous false writings were submitted, bringing error within and confusion without. Christianity became viewed as a religion that couldn't come to unity or make up its own mind. With the alleged conversion of Constantine in the fourth century, the church became dizzy with political acceptance, and their ranks swelled with false believers forced to be baptized by the empire. The church was already sick, but there were pockets of truth and light to be sure, as there always will be. Soon, the church in Rome tried to establish their supremacy over all the Christian congregations. Many wanted that, but larger numbers did not, and the church was in conflict against itself once again, or should I say, still. But even before that issue got resolved, Europe was infiltrated by Islamic conquerors, forcing the church to isolate in monasteries. The good news is that Christianity and basically Western civilization were saved because of the monasteries. <clears throat> the bad news is that Christianity became viewed as having no touch with real life. The Islamic invasion cut off Europe from the rest of the world and the culture plunged into what we call the Dark Ages. Because Europe was ruled by small kings in small kingdoms, the church was the only entity with enough money, political plout, and military might to field a worthy army. <clears throat> Though they were able to maintain some sort of order in society, the church became viewed as power-hungry, violent, and corrupt. The first major schism in the church, the Great Schism, happened in 1054, when the vast Eastern Church, which we now call the Orthodox Church, split off from the vast Western Church, which we now call the Roman Catholic Church, never again to reunite. There were also many congregations who had never subscribed to either authority. <clears throat> the Church was mired in religious cultic baggage, conflict, and corruption. I, I know, this is not an encouraging story, but there were plenty of pockets of truth and light to be sure. The Crusades succeeded in driving out the Islamic presence, but the cost in lives and integrity was severe, and the church veered even further away from her purpose and mandate given by Jesus. At this point, she little resembled what Jesus and the apostles had started. The church was systemically corrupt, politically, militarily, economically, and spiritually. <clears throat> the Crusades did succeed, however, in weakening and displacing their Islamic occupants, opening Europe up to trade again. Ventures by Marco Polo and many others brought the riches of the world to Europe's doorstep, and the Renaissance was born. Europe flourished in music, art, trade, science, and education, all under the auspices and umbrella of the Christian Church. But since the Church was spiritually weak and corrupt, indulging in many unbiblical practices and theologies, and at the same time politically corrupt, 
the church was largely viewed as a hypocritical oppressor. People were creating some of the greatest works of art known to humanity, and the church was involved in the Inquisition and corrupt political power. There were pockets of truth and light, however, to be sure. In 1517 came another major schism. We know it as the Protestant Reformation. Many true Christians who were church leaders noticed that the Roman church had gone theologically astray and become a false church. They broke off from Rome, forming a third major branch of Christianity. Now there were Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, and Orthodoxy. The three would never again unite. On the heels of the Reformation came the Enlightenment, whereby Constantine separated Christianity from commitment, the monasteries separated the church from real life, the Renaissance separated the church from joy, and the Roman church separated the church from theological and political integrity. The Enlightenment separated the church from reason. Philosophers such as Georg Hegel and David Hume said that reason and faith were completely different things. Then the late 19th century brought a barrage of detractors such as Charles Darwin, Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, Soren Kierkegaard, and Helena Blavatsky. There was also the rise of cults with Charles Taze Russell, Joseph Smith, and Mary Baker Eddy. With this bombardment in a very short time, the true church became viewed as separated from reason, hostile to science, and mistakenly thinking that there was such a thing as objective truth. The late, the late 19th century led to Impressionism and existentialism in philosophy, music, art, literature, and even education. The population was being sold a bill of goods that reality can be whatever we want it to be. The Roaring Twenties was a season of indulgence, and the church were perceived as the killjoys involved in the prohibition. Further damage was done by the Scopes trial in Tennessee in 1925, where Christians were made to look like anti-science, anti-reasonable fools. Another major blow came in 1947, when the Supreme Court overturned 150 years of legislation and legal understanding by ruling that religion was now the jurisdiction of the federal government. In 1960, they banned Bible verse recitation in public schools. In 1962, they struck down prayer in school. In 1963, officially ended Bible reading at school. Then, in the 1960s, we saw the greatest upending of cultural values by the young generation in the history of the world. This was followed by the me generation, the grunge era, and the birth of the internet. The radicals of the 1960s, many of whom are liberals and leftists, were growing up and taking positions of influence in journalism, politics, education, and business. Over the course of just a few decades, America changed radically to their worldview. The church is now viewed as culturally irrelevant. We have been socially marginalized, morally compromised, politically weaponized, and intellectually demonized. TV, media, film, social media, and schools are all now openly hostile to Christianity. The internet is a ready source of negative information about Christianity. Irreligion has gone viral and mainstream. Christians are perceived as narrow-minded, homophobic, misogynistic, puritanical haters. 
We are perceived as science-denying idiots, believing things contrary to evidence, and believing in a book that has been allegedly proven to be wrong. Christian nationalism has smeared the name of Christ even more, making the same horrible mistake of Constantine, the Crusades, papal corruption, and colonialism. Christians are perceived as violent, irrational, treasonous deplorables. So here we are. Welcome to the end of 2022. The church is in decline. We are struggling to stay relevant in a world that couldn't care less what we have to say and outwardly resent what we stand for. Various congregations are dealing with it in different ways. Seeker services, more outreach to the community, progressive theology, wholehearted acceptance and approval of LGBTQ, more radical political involvement, you name it. Some have sold their very souls to be relevant in a secular world. So in response, here's what I say. History shows us that the church, unfortunately, has always had issues. There is nothing new under the sun. Second, it shows us that the forces of secularization are always against us and have been pushing against us for at least a thousand years, gaining more strength all the time. This is nothing new either. It is not unique to our era. What we have to do, however, is to learn how to counter it in our era with strategies that work for our culture. Third, while some Christians are called to be martyrs and some must live in cultural exile, we shouldn't walk around with a martyr complex and live with an attitude of, woe is me, I'm so persecuted. Our mandate is not to grudgingly endure our time on earth until we can escape to be with Jesus. Instead, we are called to engage the world, our generation, and our culture. God loves all of those around us. Our calling is to love sacrificially, serve others willingly, be witnesses to the truth unceasingly, to make disciples of all nations, and as much as it depends on us, to live at peace with all. Fourth, what we see is that the church will be in decline, and then it will be increasing, and then it will decline again, and then it will grow again. This decline may be just another sway. We are wise to adapt our strategies to connect with our neighbors, but we are wrong to adapt our doctrine to accommodate a critical world. There will always be apostate Christians in congregations. They likely cannot be won back. There will always be compromising Christians. They've generally made up their minds. The church is sick? Yes, very. So what's new? But there are plenty of pockets of truth and light to be sure, as there always will be. Instead, we need to focus our purposes and mandates given in Scripture. Find the true Christians, the remnant I would call them, and focus there. Move with the movers. Find those who will listen to the word and who are open to influence in our culture. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. Instead, find those who will listen. Boldly live out the core of our Christianity as faithfully as we can. Major on the majors. There is a God. He can be known. Jesus is God. The Bible is inspired and authoritative, and it's true. There is evidence for what we believe, etc. Major on the majors. We also subscribe to logic, reason, science, truth, and reality. Love God faithfully and love the world responsibly. That's how to be the church. If we are full of authenticity, integrity, consistency, and truth, we will be faithful witnesses and strong disciples of our Lord. It is unfortunately the nature of our faith 
that we are susceptible, so susceptible to fakers, hypocrites, wrong influences and misdirection. Unfortunately, it is the nature of humanity to be weak, self-oriented, distractible, biased, and sometimes even ignorant. It is the nature of the church, however, to be like Jesus. Let's pick that one, the last one, the right one. And if we do, the remnant will remain faithful and strong, a true light that will be the destination for those truly searching.